Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week on the Q&A podcast, retired California Superior Court Judge LaDoris Cordell on her new memoir, Her Honor. She takes a critical look at our judicial system and offers suggestions on how to improve it. Our conversation touches on the importance of judicial independence and the impact of mandatory minimum sentencing, racial bias in jury selections, and the debate over police reform. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Judge LaDoris Cordell, you've published your memoir titled Her Honor. You say in the acknowledgments that people had been encouraging you for a long time to publish your memoir. Why did this seem like the right time? Well, it seemed like the right time for a couple of reasons, Susan, and and thank you very much for talking to me about Her Honor. Um, The first is that I had left the bench and had some time to really reflect on everything that had happened during my nearly 20 years on the bench. Um, The second is that um, during the last eight years I was on the bench, and I'm not sure what started it, I began writing letters every Friday to my parents. And these are real letters. I'm not talking emails, right? So I was writing letters about everything that had happened that week. And I'd write on a Friday afternoon because generally, if you're a trial judge, your Friday afternoons are a little light because you're planning on what's going to happen the following week. Uh, So after I retired, um, I went back east. I'm from just outside Philadelphia and visited my parents. And my mother says to me at one point, she pulls this box out from a closet. She's a very organized woman. And she said, what do you want me to do with these? And she had kept every one of my letters that I had written for nearly eight years, once a week. Uh, And I was stunned. So I just said, okay, I'll take them. And I boxed them up and mailed them back here. And it took me a few years, you know, two or three years to actually sit down and, and start reading them. And I was stunned by one, how much work I had done, how many cases I had heard. And and really, I didn't remember them, but until that was until I started reading these letters. So that was just something else that said, you know, maybe there's something here when I started looking at all of the kinds of cases that I'd handled. And then the final thing was, was um, basically it happened during uh, the recall of Aaron Persky, where I ended up, I guess, by default, being a spokesperson for him and against the recall. And I was just stunned by how an educated electorate, I'm here in Silicon Valley, and, uh, you know, generally the electorate is very educated, very well educated. And I, I would talk about, in context of the recall, judicial independence, and how judges shouldn't be swayed by popular opinion. And the response I got, responses I got back were either what's judicial independence, or that's just a cover, it's just judges circling the wagons, or I don't care about judicial independence. And it just, all of these things came together. And I said, you know what, people, I think, do not generally understand what it is trial judges do, state court trial judges do. Um, And, you know, I saw this book as a vehicle to do it. So I look at this book as a primer and a memoir. So I kind of have a mixed genre called a primoir. (laughs) Uh, So I try to do three things with this book, educate, uh, entertain, because I have some interesting, I think, war stories in the book, and also energize, energize judges and energize voters, energize everyone, because everyone at some point in their lives is going to be impacted by state court state trial court judges. So that those were really my reasons for writing this. You write that when you took your seat on the bench in California in the 1980s, there were no African-American judges in Northern California and only a handful of women. Forty years later, what's the scorecard like on diversity in the, in the court system? So just going back, I was, I was the first African-American female uh, judge in Northern California when I was appointed by then Governor Jerry Brown in 1982. Uh, so uh, it was kind of lonely out there. There were other black female judges in California, but not in all of Northern California until I came along. Today, everything has dramatically changed, and in part, a large measure due to Jerry Brown. Because even back in the 80s, he began the process of really revolutionizing the judiciary in California. And by that, I mean appointing women, people of color, uh, folks who are gay. Um, and he just really kind of changed things. And then governors that came after him who are more conservative kind of reversed it all. So today, however, 
we have a situation across the country where it is not unusual at all to see women and judges of color on the bench. Um, can we do better? I still think we can do a lot better, uh, but it, it's just not unusual. Back in the day when I started, it was highly unusual. So, and also, you know, if you turn on your TV and you see all these judge shows, it's not unusual to see women and judges of color everywhere. So it's, it's, it's really become more commonplace for people of color and women to be on the bench, but I still believe we can do a lot better. What has the increased diversity done to the system? So, I mean, the whole premise is that, you know, you, you believe you have a stake in the system if you see people who look like you, who are maybe have your background. And I think that's true of anything, any systems at all. And it's particularly true of the judiciary. So if you're coming into the system, if you're a litigant, um, then if you see people in black robes who look like you, you're more willing to trust the system, to believe in it, uh, and you believe that you have a stake in it. As well, when you have judges who reflect the people who are coming into the court, that is people, maybe judges who came from working class backgrounds, uh, judges of color, women, judges who are gay, uh, there is more empathy. There is a sense that, okay, I'm not going to stereotype you because you're coming into my court and you are not dressed as well as some other people who come in my court. Or you come in, you're a young black male. I'm not going to stereotype you. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, there are judges who stereotype that is consciously, but then of course there's unconscious bias where judges do it. We do it because we're not even thinking about it. It's a part of kind of baked in to our whole life experience. So the more diverse, uh, the better I think the system functions for everyone, from judges to those who are in the courtroom in front of judges. After you left the bench in 2001, you spent five years for the city of San Jose as an independent police auditor. How has your combined experience on the bench and with the policing system impacted your thinking about the current debate the country's having over police reform? You know, I love your question, Susan. Um, I spent five years as the independent police auditor for the city of San Jose. San Jose is the 10th largest city in the United States. And um, that was an eye opener. For five years, I was interacting with the San Jose Police Department on a daily basis and really came to understand how police departments function and also uh, the kinds of uh, things that need to be done to start to build trust between police and members of the community. And San Jose has a very di ethnically diverse uh, population. So when I finished that experience, I, I had a deeper understanding about policing. And where I am today, uh, given also, by the way, when I was on the bench for nearly 20 years, there were plenty of police officers who testified in my court and a majority of the cases I presided over, although not exclusively, were criminal cases. So where I am today, um, I, I guess I, my view on police reform is one that's not perhaps shared by a lot of people because some people think, I think a lot of people believe that, you know, if we just tweak things, if we give police more training, uh, then, you know, things will be better. And, and I, I don't believe that at all. I think there has to be some, there have to be drastic changes made in policing to get us to a place where all of us can feel safe. Uh, and, I, that, and by that, I also mean police officers. So let me give you one quick example. Um, policing is really all about making traffic stops. That's what most police officers do. They ride around and if they see that there's a problem, and I, and I say problem in quotes, if they see a taillights out, or if they see a license plate that's out, or they see a traffic signal that someone didn't put on, that gives them a reason to, to stop people. And, and in the main, particularly in urban settings, uh, not exclusively, these police officers are not interested in, the, in the, the, you did, the fact that you didn't have your traffic signal um, on. They're not interested in it at all. What they want to do is have a reason to stop you, to then engage you in conversation, and maybe then search your car. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said to police officers, that's just fine. Um, you can make these kinds of stops, and uh, it doesn't matter that that's not really what you are really interested in. Uh, and I think what has to change is that the very nature of policing has to change. And we need to take that role out 
of policing. Police should be used to investigate crimes and certainly to help prevent crimes. But I think traffic stops are a major problem because they disproportionately focus on people of color um, and, and on poor people. Um, there are other things uh, that deal with policing. I just think, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court has given what I call superpowers to police to be able to uh, do these kinds of things. Um, that is, for example, police are allowed to lie. You can, they can lie to people they stop and say, oh, we have someone who said they saw you do X or we have your fingerprints or we have your DNA. And they're allowed to do that because the Supreme Court says that's okay. So uh, I'm just giving you kind of a surface um, sense of where I'm at in policing. But what it has done, the combination of being on the bench, listening to police officers, and then working with them, not with them, but overseeing them, has led me to conclude that we need to really make some drastic changes in policing in this country. Uh, one other issue I want to bring up is, is the use of the word, uh, which I think is inaccurate, of police unions. Um, they're not unions. In fact, police organizations don't even call themselves unions. They call themselves associations or brotherhoods or benevolent societies. And they don't call themselves unions because they're not. Uh, unions are uh, groups of workers who care about all workers, and that's not what police organizations are. I call them fraternities. And what they do is they oppose any reforms, any. I don't care how small, how insignificant they may seem, they oppose them all because what they do literally, not literally, but metaphorically, they circle the wagons and uh, they really don't want any kind of oversight or anyone telling them what they should do. I'm a strong supporter of unions. I've never crossed a picket line and never will. But these are not unions, and I think it's really a misnomer to call them that. Well, staying with that issue, just this week, uh, the Supreme Court ruled on two cases regarding qualified immunity for police, and they, they supported it in both instances, uh, which is dealing with police officers accused of using excessive force. And interestingly, they were unsigned decisions, and there were no dissents that were published. What's your takeaway from that? Well, first of all, make sure that if we're on the same page, qualified immunity um, is basically talking about civil protection, civil liability protection. So that is if an officer is accused or even found to have engaged in excessive force and you want to sue that officer for imposing that excessive force on you, qualified immunity limits your ability to do that, meaning you can sue, but you cannot hold that officer individually liable. Um, qualified immunity was invented by the Supreme Court. They just made it up in a decision. And since then, you know, it is the law of the land. Uh, I have uh, issues with it. I believe that if the Supreme Court uh, stands by it, then I think it's up to the states individually to take steps to do away with qualified immunity. It's really interesting because there's no other profession that has that that doctrine applied to it. Because you can look at other professions where people can be harmed. I mean, if they're the medical profession, uh, if it's dentistry, all of that, there's no qualified immunity. But for police, uh, the Supreme Court has decided, well, no, we ought to do that. And um, I think that it is wrong. And I hope that people will continue to push to, to change it. We're in a period, once again, of rising crime. FBI crime supports uh, report stats for 2020. Murder rate in the country rose by nearly 30 percent, largest increase on record. There were about 21,500 murders in 2020, or 6.5 per 100,000 people in the U.S. Aggravated assault, the most common form of violent crime, rose 12 percent. How uh, should I mean, we've gone through periods like this before uh, and seen reactions uh, in, in cities across the country? What is your estimation of the best way that communities should respond to statistics like this and reality of increased crime in their community? Yeah. So, one thing that's happening now is that uh, there's been a reversal. Since the murder of George Floyd, there's been a lot of protests about policing, demands for police reform, and to reduce the presence of police in the communities. And once these statistics came out, in many cities, many communities, there's been a 180, where people are saying, nope, nope, we want to increase funding for policing, we need more police, because these uh, crime rates are going up. I, I understand that, I get it, and... Uh, it is not for me to say to a particular community that uh, you're wrong. I won't, I won't ever say that. 
at the same time, we need to pull back and think about why these crime rates are rising. And um, crime rates are, don't rise in areas where people are comfortable, where people are able to uh, basically have, um, you know, that, that, that their living standards are such that they can pay their rent or pay their mortgages, that they feel good about themselves. So we have what's happening in communities. We have, for a lot of reasons, we have people who are very unhappy with their station in life. Uh, and many people feel they don't have a stake in in uh, communities anymore. And um, it's not a new thing. It's uh, based a lot on economics and on class uh, and a lot on how you know police have been acting with respect to people of color, communities of color. So there are a lot of things. And, and, and I don't think there is one solution. Uh, we do, however, and your, your question in your question is the answer is that we have to turn to communities to make sure we are listening and understand what it is they want. So there, there are just a lot of factors. There isn't any one answer. I wish I had the magic pill to say this is exactly what we should do. So there are a lot of things going on here. And the first step is find out why people are so unhappy and why these things are going on and then try to address it in any number of ways. Let's mix in a little bit of the biography that comes along with your memoir. You referenced your parents outside of Philadelphia. What was your path from Ardmore, Pennsylvania, to Stanford Law School? Right. Uh, my story does indeed start uh, with my parents and even before them, because on the, the my mother's side, my great-grandmother and great-grandmothers were the enslaved. And um, I'm, we're not clear exactly in which state they were enslaved, but uh, after emancipation, they ended up in North Carolina. And that's where my mother and her two siblings were born, not in a hospital because the hospitals didn't permit black people. Uh, so she was born in her house and there was a midwife. Uh, they came up in the great migration in 1939 and 1940. And they came up from North Carolina to Pennsylvania and eventually lived uh, just outside of Philadelphia. And that's where my two sisters and I on the middle uh, were uh, born and raised. Um, so my parents were, made it very, very clear. They're working class folks. They ran a dry cleaning business uh, in the black community. Uh, and we lived just outside and off of what's called the main line, the main line, a suburb of Philadelphia. And it's where uh, there is a lot of old money, uh, wealth, the DuPonts, the Heinz families, all out on the main line. And the black community in which I was raised was one that provided service for the wealthy community. So both of my grandmothers were the help. Uh, and there were other members in my family. One was a chauffeur. Um, so they provided services uh, for folks of wealth who lived on the main line. Uh, we lived in uh, a community that was, I said, a black community, but I ended up because of where the district and county lines were drawn, going to public schools that were predominantly white and very, very good schools. So there were a handful of black students in the public schools that I attended, and they were very good schools. And uh, my parents expected all of us to do well. And so we did well. Uh, and they also made it clear, every one of us, uh, we were all going to go to college, and we did. Uh, I ended up going to college in Ohio at Antioch College, which was a terrific experience for me uh, because it has a co-op program where I could leave the campus and uh, the students had to. Every three months you had to pack up and leave and go somewhere in the world, just be in the world. Uh, and uh, my experience, the first co-op I had, the experience of just being in college three years, you're 17 years old, I head out and I went to the Mississippi Delta um, and set up a tutoring center in Myersville, Mississippi. And this is... Um, this is, we're talking 1967, the schools still had, were just beginning to be integrated. And so we're talking like from 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Here I am, 1967, and students are just starting. Black students are just starting to go to school with white students. Uh, so it basically was that my parents, uh, the expectation from them for us was that you will go to college. Um, all of my sisters went on to graduate school, and I ended up coming to California to go to law school here at Stanford. There hadn't been any lawyers in my family before, but I kind of ruled things out. I ended up, I started majoring in Spanish, and I lived in Mexico and studied at the Universidad de Guanajuato and came back from that experience seeing 
racial discrimination in Mexico, where the indigenous darker skinned folks were at the bottom and were the domestic, were the help and were not treated well. And I, I just came back frustrated and decided to change my major and ended up being a theater major in, in drama and speech, which was just great preparation for, for the law. And I say that because I ended up um, being a litigator. I loved um, being in the courtroom and the, the, the object as a litigator is to persuade, to persuade jurors or to persuade a judge if you're having just a court trial. And theater is all about persuading your audience. And then of course, when I ended up becoming a judge, we're really talking about theater because then I'm the producer director, right? Everybody in the courtroom does what I tell them to do. When I walk in, everybody stands up, uh, they're told to sit down and then they speak when I tell them to speak and they stop talking when I tell them to stop talking. Uh, and then it's on me, of course, to to make decisions and in many instances. So um, that was really the, the, the road that I traveled. My sisters traveled in terms of they're also going on to college and then going into graduate school. Um, and uh, law school for me was a rule out, rule out math and sciences. They were not my strong suits. And I ended up uh, going into law and it, it law became my passion and it still is my passion. You tell the story in the book of the phone call that changed your life, the suggestion that you might serve as a judge for one day. Would you would you tell that for our audience? I'd love to. Um, so there's something uh, that many states have. It's called a, a judge pro tem program. Pro tem literally from Latin means for the time. And it really means you're judged for a day. And um, it's a way uh, in, at least in my court, where uh, people, lawyers would be got a phone call and I got a phone call from a judge who said, you know, we have a judge pro tem program and I'm trying to make it more diverse to have women and people of color participate. Would you like to be a judge for a day? Can we put you on a list? And my answer was sure. I had never thought about being a judge. I had appeared in front of judges, but never thought that, you know, I would wear the black robe. And these cases were small claims cases. That is like uh, the Judge Judy cases where there are no lawyers allowed in small claims court and where people are suing each other. And at the time, the maximum, the limit was $5,000. Today, it's at least in California, you can sue someone in small claims court for up to $10,000. Uh, so one day, you know, a few months later, I get the phone call. Your name has come up on the list. Can you come be a judge for a day? And I'm like, sure. So I go to this court, it was just, I was working at the time as an assistant dean at Stanford Law School. I get in my car, I drive uh, south to a courthouse and um, they hand me a robe and I get a file and I go into a courtroom and I preside over my first case. Uh, I'm a little reluctant to tell people what the case was about because I, I, I'd love for people to read it. Um, all I can say is that after that case, um, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. I really loved wearing the robe and making decisions. And just as a little bit of a teaser, the case that really got me into judging was all about hair, okay. like hair, hair. Well, we'll, we'll see if that encourages uh, sales to find out the hair story. Uh, as you referenced, your book, your memoir also mixes chapters about your own experience and then ultimately prescriptions from that 20 years of experience for how you might uh, effectively change the system for the better. So I want to dig into a few of those. First, um, uh, the group that, of fixes that have to do with selection and training of judges. You, you suggest that there needs to be more clinical training about judging in law schools. Would you explain? Sure. And thank you for bringing this up. The, the next to last chapter is called The Fix, where I propose 10 ways in which everyone can make our legal system better, that is to help repair it, because I believe it's broken in many ways. So if you think about judging, uh, judges come from lawyers. You have to have been a lawyer before you can be a judge. In California, for example, you must be a lawyer for at least 10 years to then become a judge. So if the pool from which judges come are lawyers, lawyers are all trained in law school. And yet, not one law school in the country has any kind of a program or any kind of training for judging, um, and which is, I think, highly unusual. For example, if you look at Germany, they have training specifically if you want to be a judge. That's, that's your law training. If you decide you want to go in that route, that's the training. In, in this country, there is none. So literally, you can be a lawyer who practiced law for 10 years, who did nothing but contract 
transactions and negotiations, which means you really weren't in court hardly at all. And you could decide one day, I want to be a judge. You could apply uh, or you could run for a seat depending on you know what's available. And then you could be a judge and then, then be handed a robe. And then here you are, go into court, and then you are going to preside over, let's say, family court and decide who gets custody of the kids. And remember, all of your legal career, all you've done is handle contracts. So I, I think that's appalling. And uh, I think that the first set of the ability to train should start, obviously, in law school, and where we should expose people who are even thinking, students who are thinking about, maybe I might want to be a judge one day to do that. So I propose in the fix uh, that there should be clinical training. Um, in, and by clinical, that means hands-on. So it's not a lecture. You're actually doing judging. And I don't just make this up because I actually did it. Uh, toward, in my last year on the bench, I had this idea, and I went to a, a nearby law school at Santa Clara Law School, and I, I interested students in saying, would you like to preside over small claims cases? So I had them do it. I sat second chair with them. I got permission from the litigants to do this, and it was the students who actually individually presided over a case. And it was an eye-opening experience for them. Uh, they learned a lot, and I could see just changes happening with the students who are now in a position to listen and then make decisions about um, people's lives. Uh, so that's what I suggest in, in the book. And I'm hoping that law schools will pick up on this and we can start a movement and bring judging to law schools. Do you happen to know if any of those students that you worked with ended up as judges? My guess is it probably it may be too soon to tell um, because when I created the program, it was in about 2001 or the end of 2000. So let's see, 10 years out. Yeah, some of them might. So I haven't followed up uh, on them. So by, say, around 2000, let's see, maybe around 2012 or 13, some of them might be eligible. So I, you know, you've given me a great idea to follow up and see if I can find out if any of them were. But as of this point, I don't know if they have. You referenced election of judges uh, and explained to readers that the system of electing judges in this country actually came as a reform for patronage appointments that had been the norm beforehand. But you say it really doesn't work for the citizenry today. Why not? Because judicial elections are really controlled by special interest groups who have a lot of money. Um, judicial elections are all about campaigning, all about raising money, all about getting uh, TV ads, radio ads, it all takes money. And what has happened, and specifically with Supreme Courts around our states, so every there's a federal system where we have a U.S. Supreme Court with nine justices. Then we have our state court judges, and Her Honor is focused primarily on our trial court judges. But these are, there are about 30,000 trial court judges and then there are appellate judges those who review decisions that trial judges make and then you have the states have their supreme courts which are the ultimate deciders except in new york it's called the court of appeal and the supreme courts are your trial courts um, so uh there are races now very partisan races for uh state supreme court seats and that means people who want to be on those Supreme Courts align themselves, and usually they become very political. They become either very, they're either conservatives supporting them or they're liberals supporting other candidates, and then the money starts to pour in. And uh, you have these people running for these seats making promises about what it is they will or will not do. They are acting like politicians, and judges are not politicians. And that line has just become blurred. And it's very dangerous because if you look at our democracy, we have these three pillars, right? We have legislative, executive, and the judicial branch. That is not, the judicial branch is independent. It cannot be, cannot be, must not be political. But that's what's happening now. So my concern is that with these judicial elections, they become politicized. It's all about money. And the people with the most money win. And that is not what I believe those who thought about creating a judiciary in this country back in the day even thought would happen. So I think we need to pull back. I, I don't believe in 
or support these judicial elections. And and believe me, I know of what I speak because I write in the book, I was elected. At first I was appointed, but I wanted to move up in the judiciary and I ran and I won. But I, that doesn't mean that that was the, the best system. I think there should be merit commissions um, that should evaluate judges. I also think, or, or evaluate candidates who want to be judges. And I also think that people who want to be judges, that they should have tryouts, they should have auditions, they should be required to preside over, let's say, small claims cases, be a judge pro tem. Um, and they ought to be scrutinized in that fashion because that's not what's done today at all. How about judicial accountability? I wanted to explore that a little bit. You have two proposals, more transparent disciplinary proceedings and then a limit to judicial recalls. Let me start with the recalls because you referenced earlier being involved in the campaign to recall California Judge Aaron Persky. We have a video clip from him in uh, May 30th, 2018. Uh, at a rally uh, during that can- recall campaign. And then I'd like to have you explain what your concern is about judicial recalls. Someday you may be on the right side of the law and the wrong side of public opinion. And when you step into a courtroom before a judge, you will expect, you will request, you will demand a judge who will follow the rule of law, who will tune out public opinion because they must, they must to preserve our system of justice. So I don't know if it, it, uh, we should dwell on the particulars of that case so much as an example of why you're concerned about the recall process. Right. The, you know, the, the, the recall specifically around Aaron Persky was all about judicial independence. That's what it was all about. Um, other people, you know, were fr- people who wanted him out were framing it like, oh, this is a bad judge and we don't like the decisions he's made. That was all really a smokescreen. What was really happening was an attack on judicial independence. A judge made a lawful decision that was controversial in sentencing um, Brock Turner, and uh, some people didn't like it. It was lawful. And as a result of that, the judge was recalled. And during that campaign, I spoke out because Judge Persky couldn't speak out because the rules at the time in California was that if there was a pending case, a judge is not allowed to talk about it ever. So there had to be surrogates, and I ended up being one of the surrogates and perhaps one of the main surrogates in in promoting his cause, which was to say he did nothing wrong. Uh, you might disagree with it, but that's not how our judici- judiciary should function in that if you don't like what a judge said or how a judge ruled, albeit lawfully, then, you know, the judge should go. That's not an independent judiciary. Um, so... Um, we can hold judges accountable. And I'm not opposed to recalls at all. I'm opposed to recalls that say, just get a judge out because you don't like what the judge did, albeit what the judge did was lawful. I think recalls are fine uh, if a judge has engaged in malfeasance, if a judge has committed a crime, um, engaged in misconduct, the public should have a right to hold that judge accountable and not wait till that judge's term is up and do a recall. So there are at least two states that have that rule that say that judicial recalls can only be for those reasons. And never when a judge has done something lawful or where a judge has exercised his or her discretion and done something that was lawful. Uh, And I think that should be the rule in in every state. Federal judges can never be recalled. They They are appointed for life and they can never be recalled. So this is only applied within within and among the states. So, but judges can be held accountable um, without recalls. Uh, our decisions can be appealed. They are appealed, and that's what appellate courts can tell us. Uh, they can reverse our decisions and say, nope, you were wrong, that's not good. And also, when judges' terms are up, uh, at that time, their tenure on the bench can be reviewed, I think should be reviewed by merit commissions, and by input from litigants who have appeared in front of the judges to evaluate, to say, whether or not this judge should continue on for another term. Generally, judges serve for a term of six years. These, I'm talking trial court judges. In California, it's six years. And at that time, then the judges can decide, okay, I've had enough, I'm done, or decide they want to stay on for uh, another term, in which case, in California, any lawyer who has been a lawyer for at least 10 years can run against that judge and say, well, your term's up and I want your seat. 
and can run. So there can be elections. And then there are some times where the timing is such that they can't run. That's because the law said so, in which case the, it's left to the governor to appoint. Uh, so that's that's there are many ways. Those are the kinds of ways to hold judges accountable. I just think that recalls that allow judges to be removed just because, oh, we don't like what that judge did, albeit it was a lawful decision. I think that that has no place in it uh, if, if we want to have an independent judiciary. Turning from uh, the work of judges and the accountability of judges to the law, one of the earliest chapters in your, uh, about your experience on the bench in your book has to do with the juvenile justice system. And you write that over time, the juvenile justice system has become increasingly punitive. What are the trends that you're seeing? Well, let's go back first, and thank you for raising this issue, is that juvenile courts were established uh, specifically for juveniles to say that they can be redeemed, they can be rehabilitated if they've engaged in in some sort of criminal behavior. It was not about punishment. It was about how do we make get this person on the right track. And over the years, um, that has changed, where the system has become much more punitive. Um, and so... The trend now, as a, as a result, really, of Black Lives Matter and the inner aftermath of George Floyd's death, people have been looking at the criminal legal system. And, and I hesitate to call it a criminal justice system because there's so many things that are not just, but we're, you know, the idea is we're, we're working to get there. So there are many things in our criminal legal system that people are now looking at, are now looking at and one of them is in the juvenile court system. Um, for example, prosecutors were, you know, have been very, very, um, you know, not hesitant at all to try juveniles as adults um, or, you know, to charge, you know, gang enhancements, all kinds of things that end up taking juveniles out of the juvenile system and putting them in the adult system. Um, so I write in the book um, that um, I, I want the focus really to get back more to uh, away from being punitive and dealing with juveniles, because I think in the main, um, you know, with with rare exception, uh, there is hope for every kid, every young person that comes into the juvenile system. Um, admittedly, there may be some, I think, very, very rare, uh, the exceptions where they're just so messed up that there's just really no hope, that they're so destructive. Uh, but that's just so rare. Uh, the, my experience, and I presided in the juvenile court for a few years, is that uh, I, I, I really believe in redemption. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, oh, you know, let's just look the other way and let's just be soft on everybody. That's not what I'm saying. But our primary, primary goal is to uh, look at rehabilitation, rehabilitation and redemption. I also think that should be the case in adult court, although we've got different kinds of behaviors we have to, we have to look at. So we're just talking about juvenile court. Yeah, I think we should, we must move away uh, from the direction we have been going, which is to be more punitive and to look more at redemption and rehabilitation. The stat you share in the book is that there are currently over 2,600 inmates who are 17 years of age or younger at the time of their crimes who are serving life sentences without the possibility of parole. I have another clip. This is from 2009. Attorney Brian Stevenson speaking after Sullivan v. Florida, which had to do with juvenile punishment and whether a non-homicidal offense can be sentenced to life without parole. Let's listen. To say to any child of 13 uh, that you are only fit to die in prison is cruel. And we believe that the Constitution prohibits that kind of punishment and that this court should enforce that in this case and in the Graham case. We're very hopeful uh, that uh, we can uh, create the kind of jurisprudence that sentences children rationally and appropriately. And we concede that some kids were going to have to be punished and have to be sent to prison, but we don't believe that any child, particularly a child of 13, should ever be condemned to die in prison. So that was after oral argument. What did Sullivan v. Florida do to the system? So and as a result of that case, and remember what Brian was talking about, these are juveniles who are sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for non-homicidal conduct. So they did not engage in murder. And the court has said you cannot, uh, basically agreed with Brian Stevenson, it says you cannot sentence juveniles to life without the possibility of parole for non-homicidal conduct. Um, and that's a, that is what Brian advocated for, and that should be the case. 
So what do we have though? We still have a system here where judges have the discretion to sentence juveniles who are tried as adult to life without the possibility of parole where they have committed murders. Um, and I believe that's a problem that there should not be that discretion. No, in my view, no juvenile should ever be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And today, judges still have that discretion. One of the stories that you tell is about a 16-year-old whose trial was in your court, and this has to do with the felony murder rule. And you call for reform of it. What would reform of this rule call? I guess right now, as you report, 45 states follow the felony murder rule. First of all, what does it, what does it entail? So felony murder says that any person who is engaged in conduct that results in the death of someone is basically as culpable as the person who actually caused the death. So to be more specific, and it's a, the case I describe in, in the book is a 15-year-old a girl who um, was in a in a gang, but they weren't a, they weren't a, they had no history of violence. But what they decided to do was they wanted to just leave and go to Southern California. So they decided they were going to rip off um, someone they knew, quote unquote, a friend, and just take his van and just drive to Southern California. So she was a part of this group, and um, she um, was not present when they pulled this person out of the van and ended up stabbing him and killing him and leaving him for dead. So she wasn't there. She was actually out getting her clothes from her parents' house to join them to run away. Uh, she knew that they were going to take the van, but she had no notion that anyone was going to be killed. Uh, so when she gets back, this guy's dead. They jump in the van and off they go. Uh, they are caught shortly thereafter and everyone those who were engaged in the stabbing uh were charged with murder and tried in adult court she was tried in juvenile court for the murder and she was deemed to um be just as culpable as the people who actually did the stabbing now she wasn't there she had no idea that anyone was, was going to be killed she didn't even know that anyone had a knife and yet, uh, under the felony murder rule, she could be and was charged with the murder of this young man. And her trial was before me in juvenile court. In juvenile courts, um, there are no juries, so it's just me uh, presiding over the case. Um, so in the book, I write about my decision in the case. Um, and as a result, uh, it is my view that the felony murder rule should be abolished. Uh, that young girl... Um, was not a murderer. And yet uh, the felony murder rule labeled her a murderer. She was not a murderer. Um, and uh, some states, California is one of them recently that said, you know, we need to stop that. We will only look at those who are actually engaged in the murder, charge them with murder, and not use the felony murder rule. And I think that should be the case throughout the country. Well, speaking of uh, trials by juries, there's a, another big trial that's in the news right now. The jury selection is underway in Georgia for the Ahmad Arbery murder trial. And you write about the trial by jury system and things about it that work and things that don't. Would you explain more? Yeah. And, and let me give you one example. First of all, the, the juries are just so important if we're going to have a system that really works for everyone. I really believe in our jury system. Um, and so I have a chapter in the book about juries um, and about things like jury selection and jury compensation. Um, and I actually make some recommendations where jurors, I think, are dr dramatically and drastically underpaid. An example, California, jurors get paid $15 a day to do a an amazing civic duty. And I think that's reprehensible. We need to change that and, and increase the compensation. But when we get to the actual trials, uh, one of the main things that's happening, for example, in the Ahmad Arbery case right now is jury selection. And one of the key things in jury selection are things called peremptory challenges. And it's basically this. Uh, generally, each side, prosecution and defense, and I'm just talking criminal cases now because peremptory challenges are also used in civil cases where people are suing each other. But let me just get back to criminal cases. So as in the Ahmad Arbery case, 
each side is entitled to a certain number of peremptory challenges. And what that means is you have a right as the lawyer to say, I don't want that person on the jury. And you can say, I you know, request that jury, be, that juror be dismissed. And you don't have to give a reason. So peremptories are just, you can just, at no reason at all, and you get a certain number of them. However, if it turns out, for example, and it has happened quite a bit in, in trials around the country, let's say the prosecutor is using peremptory challenges to dismiss only people of color. Let's say just black people. First one, second one, third one. And finally, the defense can say to the judge, judge, I think there's a problem here. The prosecutor has dismissed three black jurors, and there are only a handful of black jurors in the pool, and that's racism. And and so that prosecutor should be held to explain why. So at that point, the judge is required to say to the prosecutor, well, there's an objection here. What is your reason for using your peremptory challenge? And that's when a reason has to be given. So generally, the rule is if the prosecutor gives a race neutral answer, then it's up to the judge to decide, well, is that legitimate or not? And that's generally what happens. A prosecutor will give a quote unquote race neutral answer. For example, well, I dismiss that juror because, you know, the juror wasn't making good eye contact with me and he looked like maybe he was a little angry. And I thought, well, maybe he doesn't like me. So that's why race neutral, angry or that juror wore some jeans today and had a T-shirt and, you know, looked like maybe he wasn't really respectful of the whole process, race neutral. But it's up to the judge to decide, is that is that really legitimate or not? Um, in most instances, judges just rubber stamp whatever it is the, the race, race neutral response is. And so there are problems with that because um, if you can give any kind of an answer and still get rid of only one group of jurors that say all black jurors or all Lat Latinx jurors, um, there's a problem. So um, there is reform now. People are looking at peremptory challenges and saying, you know, we sh that that shouldn't work. Or they're saying you can have peremptory challenges, but judges need to be more proactive and dig deeper into finding out really what's going on and making decisions about whether or not that's in fact race neutral. I do want to note that Thurgood Marshall, when he was on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, said um, he was quite clear. He said peremptory challenges are awful. They really just promote racism in trials and they really should be done away with entirely. So there, people are now looking at this issue. Uh, and in California, uh, recently, there's the governor has signed a racial justice act, which puts the burden on judges to really look at these issues and to hold hearings. Um, that means stop the trial and hold hearings to determine what's going on when exact when let's say the defense says there's here a pattern of using peremptory challenges to get rid of a certain group or class of people. We have about 10 minutes left in our conversation. I have one other big topic uh, to put before you, and that's on the prison system. You describe it as a mass incarceration mess. The U.S. Sentencing Project reports that there are 2 million people in the nation's prisons and jails, which is a 500 percent increase over the last 40 years. 20 of those years you served as a judge. So what's happening in the United States? Well, I think the mass incarceration, uh, which really disproportionately impacted people of color, um, is a result of mandatory minimum sentencing laws um, and also known as three strikes laws. These are laws that don't give any discretion to judges and basically give all the power to prosecutors. Prosecutors decide whether or not to charge people with crimes, and they can decide what kind of charges to bring. And they can decide, well, we're going to call, we're going to uh, charge you with a crime where it's a strike. Meaning, um, if you're convicted of this, the judge will have no discretion. You will go to prison for, let's say, 25 years to life. So these mandatory minimum sentencings um, are basically take all the authority away from judges in how to sentence people. So Basically, sentencing is really subjective. Judges, we are told you are to look at certain rules, look at the victim, look what happened to the victim here. If there is a victim in a case, there are victimless crimes. But if there's a victim, also look at the defendant, 
look at does the defendant have a prior criminal history? Uh, does the defendant, um, what kind of upbringing did the defendant have? How remorseful is the defendant? So there are all these individual factors we are to look at as judges when we sentence, but mandatory minimum sentencing laws take away that discretion. They just paint all defendants with the same brush. Doesn't matter what the background is, you're just going away for this amount of time. So when the three strikes law was in its heyday in California, for example, and that would be in the late 1990s, and there are three strikes laws in, in other many other states, um, there were, it was, all the power was taken away from judges to sentence. So, so once jurors can, juries convicted or defendants pled guilty, off to prison they went. And these, uh, the discretion of prosecutors to charge these strikes was used disproportionately against people of color uh, and poor people. So as a result, you end up with people serving long times, uh, sometimes life sentences in prison for crimes that were involved theft or drugs. Uh, and in fact, during its heyday, the three strikes on California, uh, the vast majority of defendants serving under the three strikes law, serving life sentences, were there for non-serious, non-violent crimes. So um, we end up now with this mass incarceration due to mandatory minimum sentencing. So with criminal, um, the reform of these criminal laws, what we're seeing is a trend of a move away from these mandatory minimums. And I hope that that trend continues. Uh, my concern is that as crime rates go up, you may see a return to this. And I don't believe that that, I know that that does not solve the problem. And in fact, studies have been done where states that did not have mandatory minimums and those that did, there was really no difference really in in crime rates. So these mandatory minimums really don't do anything to bring down uh, crime rates in these various states. So in our last few minutes, I, I want to move from these these weighty issues to a little more personal. Uh, sure. You write in your book about the fact that you used to cartoon a bit when you were on the bench. And if one goes to your website, you can find numerous examples of it. We want to show a little bit of it. How did uh, that, um, I guess, hobby come about? And, w and what were you trying to illustrate about life on the bench? Sure. I, I started drawing, I guess I've always drawn. As a kid, I would draw cartoons. I did a lot of sidewalk chalk drawings at our house. I was just always like to, to draw. Um, and I've done some serious artwork too that's on my, my website as well. Um, so when I get on the bench, here I am. And, and I will tell you, judging is not always exciting. You know, sometimes you're here, you're presiding over your umpteenth drunk driving trial. You know exactly what's going to happen. And going to testify and it's up to the jurors really so you know I'm kind of paying attention but I'm also doodling so I do did a lot of doodling at the bench and um, I just started also drawing these cartoons and I got an idea about you know why don't I maybe draw some legal cartoons and just kind of make fun of the legal system and I'm not, I'm not the first to do it uh, Domier um, French artist cartoonist satirist uh, made fun of the, the judiciary in France, and then you have Charles Bragg, a fabulous cartoonist who made fun of the medical profession and the legal profession. So and nothing new. Uh, so I I like cartooning, um, and I started making what I call my legal cartoons, and it's basically just making fun of um, things legal, but also using legal terms. Uh, so I I have one cartoon where I drew a judge. Uh, and he's smiling. It's a cartoon of a judge smiling, and he's holding up uh, a bottle of liquor. And the, the legal term is uh, take the fifth, because, right, he's holding a fifth, take the fifth. Um, so those are the kind of thing, very kind of concrete terms that I try to make fun of or lampoon in cartoons. Um, so I ended up uh, deciding to actually make these color cartoons and uh, donated them to uh, nonprofits that one that represented uh, kids and uh, they used these cartoons in calendars and sold them and made a um, decent amount of money uh, for these nonprofits. So I ended up donating them to help make money. You've spent your, your professional nonprofits. life in the law and also you spent some time as an assistant dean at Stanford Law School in the administration there. 
If you look at the cost of law school versus inflation, law school has risen much outpaced the inflation in the United States, and the profession of law is changing. So if a young person came to you today and said, I'm trying to decide about law school, how would you advise them? I'd say find a law school that offers a loan repayment program. So there are law schools such as Stanford and there are others that say, come to law school. Yes, it's expensive, but if you, when you finish, go into public service, if you are a lawyer for a nonprofit, if you become a public defender, if you become a prosecutor, if you wanna work on environmental justice issues, we will pay all of your law school loans. We'll take them. And all you have to do is do that work for five years and your loans are gone. So yes, law school's way too expensive. There are very good, by the way, state schools that are law schools, um, but they still are expensive. You're gonna come out with debt, uh, unless you're fortunate enough to have a full uh, fellowship or full scholarship. Um, what I wanna say to law schools is that every law school should have a loan repayment program and how you establish it, you go to your alums and you raise the money, you have a pool of money so that you're able to bring in especially um, young people who know they don't have the wherewithal to pay for law school education and know that they don't want to be saddled with hundreds of thousand dollars of loans because you do come out with, oh, you know, six figure loans. It's that they give them a way uh, to unload that debt. And also it's a way to encourage uh, lawyers to go into public service because there are jobs out there for those who want to go into the corporate field make a lot of money and you can pay off their loans. But I think we need many, many more lawyers to go into public service and law schools can make that happen and ought to. I think my, my two minutes left and the question might be too big, but a blurb on the back of your book jacket says that you believe in the system. We're in an age where some people are questioning about whether or not the system does work for them. Why do you believe in it? I absolutely believe in it. I've devoted my entire professional life to the legal profession, and I continue to do that. And I believe in it because the, the principles on which our legal system were founded are the best in the world. Due process, uh, self, the right against self-incrimination, the right to a jury trial. Those principles are absolutely fantastic, wonderful. We need them. They preserve our democracy. The problem has been in the implementation and so what we must focus on is getting that implementation right. We can do that. I absolutely believe it is happening. And I want those people, uh, particularly people who read Her Honor, to become energized to get out and, and make those principles really hold true. So um, I believe in it and I will believe in that system and keep fighting for it for as long as I can breathe. Judge Ladoris Cordell, the book is titled Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It. Thanks for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you so much, Susan. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.